Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TED interview. This is Chris Anderson, the guy lucky enough to run TED. Uh, here at TED, we're borderline obsessed with the power of ideas. Ideas are such weird things. You know, they get inside your head and they might just give you a little piece of knowledge, or they might actually really reshape how you see the world. They can even change who you are. They're this powerful common currency that humans have and can share with each other. Now, we normally share them in the form of TED Talks, which are, you know, recorded on a stage, 12, 15, 18 minutes at a time. But here's the thing about ideas. They don't just land perfectly formed. They want to be critiqued, played with, iterated on. And sometimes that takes longer than 18 minutes. So in the series, I'll be having hour-long conversations with some of the most compelling TED speakers to dive deeper, learn more. And there is no better medium to do that dance than podcasting. On this first episode, my guest is author Elizabeth Gilbert. Fifteen years ago, in response to a personal crisis, she took a trip around the world and wrote about it. And that book, Eat, Pray, Love, became a global phenomenon, topping bestseller lists for years. In 2009, Liz came to the TED stage to talk about how hard it was to follow that success with another book. So Liz started a research project where she explored the question, how do other societies conceive of creativity? And once again, a very personal quest for Liz, a desire to understand how creativity happens, turned into inspiration for millions of viewers and a book called Big Magic. Liz has always been open to new possibilities. Two summers ago, she announced the amicable ending of her marriage and a new relationship with her best friend, the writer Rhea Elias, who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Rhea passed away in January of this year. Liz, that fact makes it all the more astonishing that you're willing to come now and spend time with me. Welcome. I'm so happy to be here with you, Chris. Thank you so much. You always invite me to things, and I always say yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I always know it's going to be good. Well, um, I can't imagine what you've been through this past couple of years. Um, but let's, let's perhaps not start there. Let's, why don't we start with the subject of your TED Talk and the subject of Big Magic, which is the, these insights that you have around creativity. They are not the usual story we hear about creativity. In the TED Talk, you put out there this notion that creative genius wasn't something that people have. It's not like there are ordinary people and then there are these geniuses who have this sort of special ability to do extraordinary things. That genius is actually something that comes from the outside. Talk about that. Yeah, well, I, I want to start by saying that when you describe my ideas about creativity as being unusual, I agree with you, but only to the extent that they are unusual only very recently in history. My ideas about creativity are actually very classical and they're very normal and they're very human for how human beings regarded creativity for nearly all of human history until basically the middle of the 19th century. <laughs> you know, what happened was there was this this really toxic revolution in creativity that I like to I like to blame on the German Romantics, um, you know, that put the individual at the center of the story, a very narcissistic version of creativity, a very great man based version of creativity, and it all came from you. It all came from you, from your talent, from your greatness, from your efforts, and generally speaking, in a very romanticized way, from your struggle and your pain and your suffering. And so what became idealized was the suffering itself as the badge of honor of a creative mm. person, which all you have to do is look at any of the arts in modern Western society to see how idealized that still is. And I don't personally believe that that's how human beings made art for most of civilization and for most of humanity. I think that art and creativity have always been a conversation between a human being and a mystery, a mystery that they wanted to connect to. And that mystery is called inspiration, which literally means the in-breath, you know, that mm. something comes to you. And what I find fascinating is that even the most kind of didactically rational, empirical thinkers in the world, when they talk about where their ideas come from, they tend to use the ancient language of inspiration. Even they do. They say, this idea came to me. You know, like they, that's still how we say it. But if you were to nail them down on it, they'd be like, no, 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 it came from me. 
And I'm like, well, I'm not sure it didn't come to you. <laughs> so and, that's where it all begins for me. And then where it gets even more surprising is that when you say an idea comes to people, you don't just mean an idea in the sense of a kind of neuronal pattern of electrical activity. You literally mean something from the outside coming in. Talk, talk a bit more about that. Yeah. And the way I describe it is only the way I've empirically experienced it, which has broken down in my life to this notion, which is that ideas are living entities. They have consciousness. They don't have matter. They can't be seen. They can't be felt. They can't be proven, but they have will. And the way I picture it, and it's sort of whimsical, but I also have literally based my life on this, is the, the, the universe is sort of swirling with these ideas that wish to be created. And they're constantly looking for human collaborators because for some reason we have this oddly sensitive consciousness that can hear them and find them. And so the way I picture it is that they just sort of roam around being like, are you my mother? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? And every single human who is struck by inspiration describes the experience exactly the same way. It's a, it's a very mystical experience that's you know, there's chills, there's a, a feeling of your stomach kind of getting upset, there's there's a dampness on the back of your neck, there's that uneasy feeling of falling in love or about to jump off a cliff, there's mm. nervousness, and then there's this distraction, you know, where the idea sort of consumes you. And in that, in that consuming, which can take months, weeks, years, the idea is, is interviewing you and asking you, do you want to do you want to do this thing with me or not? And and that's the most important conversation that I think human beings can have, is that dialogue between your willingness to cooperate and show up and make something with this idea and manifest it, and the idea's desire to be made, and um, and the question of whether you are indeed the right partner. And my feeling is, when you say no. It just moves around and looks for somebody else <laughs> because they want so very much to exist. So let me put on my, my skeptical devil's advocate uh, hat for a minute. Yeah. So some people will say, okay, you've lost me. You're someone who believes in the supernatural, who believes in this sort of world of magic. I'm a down-to-earth person. I think the universe is made up of, of matter and atoms and electrical forces and all this other stuff is kind of woo, you know, on the outside. Um, like it seems to me that your advice can be used by even by someone who believes that view of the world, right. that there is a stance that someone can take to be open to um, creative spark? Or does, does the magic not work unless you actually believe that worldview that you've just outlined? Um, no, I'm not a fundamentalist about this. <laughs> I'm not an evangelical. You know, if, if my offering to you and these ideas can be useful to you as metaphor, then by all means use it as metaphor. It was very funny because when when Big Bang came out, I was on NPR with this with this lovely reporter who was trying very hard to take me seriously and and said, you know, there are times when you're reading Big Magic where it almost feels as though you you actually believe in magic. And she was giving me a, a sort of doorway to to excuse myself through. And I was like, oh no, I actually really do totally believe in. <laughs> you know, thank you for trying to make me sound serious on national public radio, but. I happen to prefer to live in an enchanted world, but I don't require that anybody else does. If mm. you're empirical, right, left, black, white, everything can be explained by science. Worldview helps you and you can be as creative as you can possibly be within that and you're generating an enchanting life through that, then you have what I like to call not a problem. You know, but but if it's not working for you, then, you know, come come and sit in my room for a minute. Mm. And certainly this, this lens gives you a whole new way to empower people to be creative um, instead of the mantra around creativity as something like, you know, be willing to suffer one, two, follow your passion, and then somehow turn that into this creative outburst. Well, I mean, I rail a lot against passion um, because I feel like passion can be very exclusionary and very elitist and it can leave a lot of people feeling like they don't belong in creative journeys and they don't belong in creative explorations. I'm much more interested in allowing people to follow curiosity, which is a far more gentle impulse that doesn't mm -hmm. require that you sacrifice your entire life for something. It's more of a um, kind of a scavenger hunt um, mm -hmm. where you're allowed to pick up these tiny little beautiful clues along the pathway. And it's more of a tap on the shoulder that asks you to turn your attention one inch to the left. Oh, that's a little bit mildly interesting. What is that? Okay, mm -hmm. now I'm going to take that clue. I'm going to take it another inch and I'm going to take it another inch rather than this idea that the symphony is born whole. 
you know, mm. um, because you sit down and you're struck by lightning and then you, you start to create. Curiosity, I think, is, is a far more friendly way to do creativity than passion. So I think you yourself went on a pretty amazing curiosity journey in the creation of one of your novels, and you didn't even know that it was leading there. It started off, you got curious about gardening, of yeah. all things. <laughs> tell, tell us about that, about that journey. Yeah, you know, this is, this is, I'm so obedient to curiosity. That's really my policy. My willingness in life is that if inspiration comes to me in even the smallest way, I'm so respectful about seeing what it is. And there came a time about five or six years ago where I found myself just being really but not passionately interested, just kind of interested in plants and gardening. I had just moved into a new house. It had a little bit of dirt in the back that I was able to do something with. And I just started to explore it and devote myself to it just in order to do it, you know, um, not to become a professional landscaper, but just to see where it led me. And I discovered over the course of my first summer of gardening that I was a lot more interested in the origins of the plants than I was in the plants themselves and the, the history and the ethnobiography of these plants. When did these tulips come to America? Why why wisteria? Who was the missionary who found this? What is a native plant? What is an imported plant? You know, what what's the intersection of history between humans and these plants? these things that we grow and why. And once I started looking into that, I got really interested suddenly in 19th century botanical exploration. And once I got interested in that, I got interested in the, the study of evolution as based in botanical exploration. And then I was really interested in the fact that for a lot of the 19th century, the only science that women could practice was botany because it was considered kind of a, a lady's sport <laughs> <laughs> because women have traditionally been the ones who grow things. And so it was almost as though botany were this back door that women could sneak into, into the scientific world and they could have respect and they could publish papers and they were sort of basically allowed to almost be full scientists. And then I was like, well, that's interesting. And I started looking at all those women. And then the next thing you know, I'm traveling to Tahiti and to and to Europe to study in the botanical gardens of Amsterdam, and I'm making up a 19th century female botanist, and I'm writing a novel about it. And this is why I say that the path of curiosity is the scavenger hunt, because it took me probably three years to get from, gee, it would be nice to put some plants in my backyard, to here I am in the South Pacific exploring the history of moss and inventing this giant novel. You know, I think everybody thinks that creativity comes in lightning strikes, but I think it comes in whispers. And, mm -hmm. and then the whispers can grow thunderous over time if you're patient enough to explore it almost as in the way that a scientist would. Um, so, so that's that, how it happens. That novel uh, is called The Signature of All Things. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I have to say it's an amazing work. I, Thank I you. I have a confession to make. I never read Eat, Pray, Love. That's okay. You're um, not really the demographic, Chris. <laughs> <right? laughs> no I'm offense. Glad. I did figure that out. Um, but uh, I did read The Signature of All Things, and I, I learned a lot in it, including... This idea that is woven in there, just about the you know the connectedness of knowledge that uh, that that was sort of almost revealed in the book as this sort of growing wonder and enchantment all of its own. It's really really remarkable. Um, but it, it started with that curiosity journey. That's it. What am I going to plant in this ten by ten piece of ground in my backyard? And 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 to be open to you don't need to know why you're interested in this it will be revealed if you continue to investigate that's it that's all that curiosity asks of you passion asks you to throw it all on the bonfire uh -huh. and curiosity is way more generous in that it it just says you know just give me a little bit of your time and let's see what we can do another of the pillars of um, creativity in in your worldview mm -hmm. i think is courage can you talk about that? Why does courage matter? Well, courage matters, especially in the importance of defining it as opposed to fearlessness, which is what our culture honors and which is also brutal. You know, we live in a very brutal culture. There's just a lot of demands put on people um, in terms of what they are expected to be. And fearlessness is is one of the expectations that, you know, we are memed to death about in, in our mm. culture. You know, go punch the world in the face and take it on and and kill fear and bury fear. And I, I don't ask that of myself in any way whatsoever. I'm not interested in becoming a person who is fearless because the few human beings I've met in my life who I would define as fearless were clearly sociopaths. You know, <laughs> like they, you look in their eyes and there's something very important missing. Yes. And um, fear is part of our makeup. It's something that's inherent in us. It's a protective device. And my experience with fear is to permit it to exist and then to figure out how to work with it. And to me, working with fear is what courage is. And I've never started any project that I wasn't afraid um, during the entire thing. And, and the conversation that I have with fear 
is not to say, you know, you are the death of creativity and I can't be creative because you exist, but rather to say you are part of the family of my consciousness. You are one of the emotions that I possess. And I hear your complaint and I see your anxiety and I see everything that you're putting before me about how this is going to be a disaster and how I'm going to die and how everybody's going to mock me and how I'm going to fail. And I thank Mm. you so much for your contribution. However, your sister creativity and I are going to go off on this journey now and do this thing, but you're allowed to be in the car. We're going on a road trip, but I don't expect you to not come. And once you allow fear to just be present, it seems to quiet down and go to sleep and then you can kind of go about your work, but it's never out of the picture. And I don't waste my energy trying to kick it out of the picture because that feels to me like just a colossal, exhausting waste of energy. Mm. Whereas a a radical kind of inclusive self-acceptance seems to be a, a way to be able to create a lot more. Yeah, no, that's powerful. You know, we, a lot of people are frightened of giving a, a talk, a TED talk. And um, one of the things we, we try and say is, you know, if you can embrace that fear and make it your friend, it, it, it actually can be the motivation that just helps you make a much better talk. Like it, it, use that to be the motivation to you know, just keep working at it. Right. And, uh, and, and the fear will probably get back under control. Yeah, and it wouldn't hurt so, either to to be fully aware that the other 50 people speaking at TED are equally terrified whether they appear to be or not. And yeah. there's a shared humanity in that experience of recognizing that that everybody here thinks that they're the one who's not supposed to be here. Mm. And, and another pillar, I think, for you that you talk about a lot is, is this idea of discipline, of showing up. And it's, it's paradoxical in a way, because a lot of people think of the routine of showing up as the antithesis of what it is to be creative, like being creative is being open to the moment and, you know, going wherever the spirit leads you, as it were. But um, for you, even though you believe that there is a spirit leading you on key moments, you want discipline from people. You want them to take seriously the hard work part of all this. Well, that's the devotional part. To me, that goes along with mysticism, that goes along with a a sense of spirituality and supernatural, that the human contribution is the labor. That's what we can do. And I learned very early on, it, it became incredibly clear to me that there were three factors that I was going to need in order to be successful as an artist. And one of them was luck, and the other one was talent, and the other one was hard work. And luck is predetermined by forces far outside of my, I mean, nobody understands what luck is. You know, we, we understand talent better than we understand what luck is. I don't know how to control luck. I certainly don't know how to control talent, which I do think has a genetic, um, and you know, it's, it's a lot of luck as well. Like raised in a family where I allowed, my talents were allowed to be fostered. That's very lucky. But the only one of those three that I have absolute control over is how hard I work. So it seemed to me that it was just only obvious that, that, if you mm. want to do this, then then maximize how much time you put into the third of it that you have any power over. Because the expression that I've coined, I don't know if I coined it, but I say it all the time, is, you know, your labor is the contribution to the miracle. And if I'm sitting around waiting for the miracle to do all of it, I'm going to be sitting around waiting for an awfully long time. And when people say, you know, you're so lucky that you got this inspiration, I think, well, why am I so tired? I've been working really, really hard. <laughs> um, but I also have the subtle sensitivity to know the difference when I'm working between laboring like a mule and riding on a jet stream. And every once in a while, when you've been laboring like a mule for months and months and months, suddenly something really weirdly cosmic happens and there's an opening and now you're on the jet stream and it's just flowing and you're in that space and that's magic and it's worth working very hard for. Mm. But you don't get it for free. Mm. Liz, I'd love to go back and explore a little more this notion of this world in which there are creative people who are sitting there hoping for a moment of inspiration. And then there's this universe of ideas. Now, you describe them as these entities that are sort of conscious and waiting for their their path through a human mind and out into the public sphere. There's a related worldview that in some ways isn't all that different from yours, which is this idea of memes that, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins first wrote about 30 years ago, I want to say. Um, the word meme has been sort of co-opted in the internet to mm-hmm. mean often sort of silly little pictures or, or, or GIFs that get passed around and explode to lots of views. But the original idea behind a meme is much broader than that. It's anything that can be reproduced in a mind and, and spread, including big, beautiful, powerful ideas. I just... For someone who wasn't, didn't like in full your form of magical thinking, Mm -hmm. but wanted to be creative, the notion of being open to the unique combination of memes that could form in your own mind and reproduce and be shared more broadly, and to see yourself as 
you know, your role in the world is to be in service of those memes. Yes. That's, that's, that's an amazing thing to do because those things will quite probably live on after you and, yeah. and they can literally rewire many other people's minds. Yeah. And I think we could call, you know, your view of it secular magic. Um, that's because a great, that's a great phrase. the feeling I'll go with that. that you seem to get from it is exactly the same as the feeling I get from it, which is it is awfully exciting to be a human being and it is awfully exciting to be permitted to dance and tiptoe and engage and work within this realm, you know, and what can I do to make myself be in greater service to this? Because I can't think of anything better as a way to spend my time. And I don't need to know how the ultimate meme ends. I don't need to see the mm. end game. I'm just very happy to be one of the pieces in this evolving story that's good enough i mean one of the reasons i think you you came to the worldview you did was because you, you've experienced in your life these amazing um coincidences shall we say that seem to have no other explanation than that there is this purposefulness to the ideas that are out there can you tell us the story about your Amazon novel that never was. Oh, God. I mean, that, that strikes me as just an oh, astonishing God. story. Okay, I haven't told this story in a long time, so let me see if I can if I can get the timing right. Um, so I had an idea to write a story about the Amazon jungle. I actually went to my publisher. I came with a proposal. This was a novel that I had dreamed up, and. The novel was going to take place in the 1960s, and it was about this spinster in Minnesota who worked for a large international construction company. Um, she's quietly in love with her married boss and has been in love with her married boss forever. He has a son who's a bit duplicitous, who takes over the business, gets a contract to go down and build a highway through the Amazon, which was a project that was attempted in the 1960s but failed miserably. And in my story, he goes down there, gets involved with a bunch of corruption, he disappears, a bunch of money is lost, and she, who's just been a secretary to an executive her whole life, is sent down to figure everything out. Mm. The book was to be called Evelyn of the Amazon. I was working on that book. I got a book contract for that book. I was doing research on that book. And um, around that time, I went to speak on a conference and I met the novelist Ann Patchett mm. for the first time. And, um, and she and I took one look at each other and became like devoted in love with each other friends, heard each other speak and were dazzled by each other. And at the end of the speech, she came over and we did the oddest thing because she's actually a very reserved person, but she kissed me on the lips and said, I just love you. And I said, I just love you too. So just put that aside because that's right. part of the story. In the meantime, I put away my novel because something had come up in my personal life and um, my my then partner was facing being deported from the country. I had to marry him. I had to leave the country. I ended up writing an entirely different book, which was a memoir about that experience, which was called Committed. I put the novel away. And after I wrote Committed, I returned to it with the hope of restoring this work and discovered that, and I can only describe it this way, the life in it was gone. I opened up my book of notes. I went through everything. There was no spark in it. It was a pile of dust. I tried so hard to revive that book and it was a corpse. It just, there was nothing to it. And then I met Ann Patchett again, um, only for the second time of our acquaintance. We went out for coffee to talk about what we were working on. And it turned out that she had started working on a novel about the Amazon jungle. I was like, wow, that's crazy. I was working on a novel about the Amazon jungle. I mean, already that's pretty cool. And then we sat down. I said, what's your novel about? She was about 100 pages into it at that point. And she said, it's about a spinster from Minnesota who is working in a big multinational corporation, <laughs> who's in love with her married boss, and who gets involved in this really chaotic program down in the Amazon. A bunch of money and a person goes missing, and she gets sent down there, and her life is uprooted as she goes into this jungle in order to solve this mystery. It was exactly the same story. And that's not a genre, Chris. That's not like a vampire <laughs> romance, you know, like that is so incredibly specific. And we were both, I mean, I have chills now as I'm talking about it. We sat there together and we did the math on when the idea had left me and when it had come to her. And we isolated it to the, around the time that we met. And we like to think that it actually was exchanged in the kiss. <laughs> You know, that the idea just jumped from one novelist to another and was like, this novelist is not going to be good enough for me. I'm going to use Ann Patchett. And it was the most exciting example I've ever seen of how ideas live, because there's no explanation for that. That is beyond any rational explanation whatsoever. 
<laughs> and that book, of course, became State of Wonder, which is an extraordinary novel that she then made her own, obviously, um, and is, is amazing. I'm so glad I didn't have to write this, it because she did it better. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to say, this is, this is uh, an incredible story, obviously. But the skeptical part of me is going... Love the story, You're, but surely there must be like you have must have friends in common who well, you know you <laughs> talk to one of them and then they accidentally talk to another. There was sort of unconscious transmission that way, or you you in one letter you might have mentioned something in technology, as I think you've mentioned in one of your books. Often things are invented at the same time. Right um, there, there is a sort of causal explanation for that. Yeah. You you know like certain tools come into existence and they make possible the next discovery. But I mean, the 1960s, Minnesota, where did that come from? Spinster in Spin- love with her married boss, the I guy mean, missing in the jungle, the whole, I mean, it's, it's. you know, I'm very comfortable. <laughs> I have a lot of comfort with mystery. I don't need to understand where that came from. I've got a big warehouse in my mind where I just store stuff that makes no sense and I'm very comfortable in that world. So it doesn't agitate me. It just makes me want to play more. Yeah. You know, it just makes me want to love this world more. Yeah. I mean, it could be that someone could get really glum, though. Like, they, they feel like, I'm not going to come up with anything great until inspiration on that level sort of strikes. Mm. What, what do you say to someone who's just been trying for years and they feel like they've done all they can, but somehow, you know, the moment has never quite arrived where they come up with anything that anyone else actually likes? Mm. Well, I mean, I was that person for a long time. You know, I had years and years of rejections. I've got files full of rejection letters and I didn't like it. You know, I didn't, I didn't like people not liking my work. I didn't like getting letters back from the New Yorker saying, no, thank you again and again and again and again and again. Um, but that wasn't what I was in it for. You know, that was a side effect. I, it's not that I didn't want to have recognition and success because I certainly did. And I certainly do. But the feeling that I would get when I get those letters is it's so cute that you guys think that I'm going to stop doing this mm. just because you keep saying no. The bottom line motivation that I try to give people when they say, why should I bother trying? Why should I bother trying to make a thing in this world when it probably won't work, which it probably won't. You know, a lot of stuff doesn't. Most things mm. aren't successful. Most novels don't sell. Most movies don't get made. Most scientific ideas don't revolutionize the world. Like odds are against it, you know, and it's a very rational stance to take to say, why should I bother doing this? And why should I invest this treasure of my time? You know, mm. my time and my labor, which is my greatest treasure as a human being. Why should I invest in this thing? There's no guarantee that I'm going to get anything out of it. And I can't ever promise anybody, I don't blow smoke up people's butts and tell them that it's going to work because I, it doesn't always work for me. But what I will tell them, and I can absolutely guarantee you, is that you will be a different human being at the other end of it than you were at the beginning. The process of having made something will transform you in ways that I cannot predict and you cannot imagine. And it is so interesting to find out who you're going to be on the other side of that, that that's why you do it. And then if you get subsidiary reward, you know, if you should be lucky enough to be paid for it in another way, then great. And I just went through this again. I just lived this experience again. And I thought, why does this surprise me when I'm constantly preaching this? Mm -hmm. But my partner, Rhea, died in January. I have a, had a novel due in August. And I had to start from the place of my deepest grief to write a novel that was due. I started writing it you know, in the, the middle of the spring, once I'd sort of pulled myself together. And I had started this novel before Ray got sick and before we were together. It was pitched and promised to my publisher as a lighthearted, happy, sexy, fun romp of a book. And here I am with my face on the ground in pain. And from that place, I've got to write this book. And I did all that I could to prepare myself for it in terms of trying to get my health back and trying to get my stability back and trying to get my um, I kept saying, I don't have my vitality. I don't have my vitality. How am I going to write when I don't have my vitality? And I forgot, even I forgot, you get your vitality by doing it, through doing it. Within a week of me sitting down to write this novel, I was restoring myself to who I am as a human being because writing is what I do. And 
within a few months, I had my vitality back and I even had my joy back. I started Mm. that book from a place of darkest grief and ended it in a place of tremendous happiness. And I was a different person at the end of that project than I was at the beginning of it. And I thought, I can't believe that. And yet this is what I'm telling people (laughs) day and night is trust me, go try it, go make this thing and see not what you make, but who you become. Mm. That's why it's worth doing, because your life itself is a work of art and an interesting experiment. So make your life the work of art, and what you create is not nearly as important as what you are created into through the creation, if that makes sense. It does make sense. Tell me more about this novel. I mean, did it stay the lighthearted romp, as you called it? Yeah, it did. It is. The novel is called City of Girls. It takes place in New York City in the 1940s, and it's about showgirls in the New York City theater world. And it came out of an idea I had of wanting to write a book about women who are not traumatized by sex. It is very difficult Mm. to find that story anywhere in literature. Um, Women are so punished in art for desire, and they're so brutalized. And That has not personally been my experience with sex, and it hasn't been the experience of a lot of women that I know. And I wanted to write about this group of girls who are very careless, very wild, very irresponsible, and having kind of the time of their lives when they're 19 and 20 years old in New York City, completely oblivious to the fact that the world is burning all around them, that there are wars happening, that, you know, all of this disaster. And so it's a book that the feeling that I wanted it to have was that it goes down like a tray of gin fizzes, you know, that Mm. it's just giddy and giddy and gay and light. And there's a depth that comes later in the book as the woman gets older, you know, and, and her life takes on resonance. But at its heart, it is a book about a kind of wild, romping celebration of life. And it remained that even in the wake of Rhea's death. Um, so that's amazing because yeah. you, you've had like a big theme of your work and your thinking about creativity has been to push back against this notion of, you know, the dark night of the soul is what is needed for someone to do anything great in terms of art or creativity. And yet now you yourself have been through as dark a night of the soul as anyone could, yeah. I think. And um, so, so do, have you revised your your thinking about this at no, all? No, I'm just laughing because what I want to say is that you don't have to seek out dark nights of the soul. They will find you. Pain hmm. will find you. Suffering hmm. will find you when the time is ready for it, when it's your turn to to suffer. Believe me, you'll suffer. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to romanticize it and you don't have to glamorize it because it's Mm. part of the experience of what we come here and experience. And what I went through in the 18 months of loving Rhea and nursing her through her cancer, you know, watching her just be destroyed by this disease and was so horrific that it, you know, it's shocking how much you can suffer. The, 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 you know, my experience with suffering is that true suffering, you can't have any perspective on it. You know, I, I have perspective on it now, but I didn't have any perspective on it when it was happening. True suffering is literally unbearable. <laughs> you know, that's how mm. you know you're in it. You can't, you can't bear it. It's awful, but you don't have to move in. You know, um, because resilience is also one of the things that we possess. And healing is one of the things that we possess. And perspective over time becomes one of the things that we possess. Or we're able to look back on our dark nights of the soul and see it in a grander context and be able to see the way that, you know, what I experienced with Rhea prepares me now to sit in the room with people when they are in their unbearable suffering and and to be in a, in a state of compassionate relaxation with them to be able to know like, oh boy, I know where you are, hmm. you know? Um, and, and I'm so glad that I know where you are and I don't know how you're going to get off that floor, but you will. In the meantime, I'm just here holding space for you while you're in agony. So what I don't like about what I think of as art school suffering, hmm. <laughs> you know, which is that sort of a goth commitment to the only way I'm going to be taken seriously as an artist is if I follow the pain, is that mm. you're excluding half of the human experience because a good deal of the human experience is pain and suffering and darkness, but it's not the full story. There's also incredible love, resilience, beauty, and grace within that as well. And if you don't tell both of those pieces of the story, then you're not telling the full story. I mean, what I hear you saying, Liz, is that you have written this new book. It's not 
directly from that extraordinary dark night of the soul that you've been through. It's that you've been through this process of healing and, uh, and resilience and that you've actually used this novel in a way to be part of that healing. Like the, the actual dedication to go there, to immerse yourself in those original ideas has actually, has actually helped you. Yeah, it was the healing. Um, and, and the mistake that I was making, and, and I wouldn't have done that if the book wasn't so ferociously due. You know, my, my <laughs> publisher had... Um, Power of a deadline. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was a real deadline. And they had very graciously given me an extra year when Ray got sick. And not a lot of people who have jobs get that kind of time to be able to spend with a partner who's dying. And I'm so grateful for that. And I wanted to reward them by giving them the book that they paid me for and that I owed them, yeah. you know, but, but the, the deadline was very serious. And, you know, had I, had I been not in that deadline, I would have said, this is a terrible time for me to work. What I need to be doing is grieving. Um, but, but what I actually needed to be doing was creating, you know, mm. the creation for me is the, is the antidote to despair. And as far as the idea of suffering goes, you know, what I do know about myself is that I am willing, the word willing has been ringing through my consciousness for, for months now, for years. Um, I am willing to feel whatever needs to be felt. My friend Martha Beck says beautifully, I will feel whatever I need to feel to not fall into depression. Mm. And that includes grief. I will feel sorrow. I will feel rage. I will feel pain. Because depression is the absence of feeling. It's this sense that I cannot feel this. It's too painful. It's too horrible. Mm. And so I'm going to shut down. And I won't. And I didn't. I didn't shut down all through Ray's death. And I didn't shut down after. And I'm not shut down now. So I, I want access to the whole palette of, of human emotion. I'm willing, to, um, I'm willing to be in all of it at the same time often. <laughs> Tell me a bit more about Rhea. Oh, my God. Um, Rhea was everything. Rhea was the biggest person I ever met in my entire life. She was so epic. She was a Syrian immigrant. She came to this country when she was 10 years old. And she was a musician. She was a kind of a rock star in the 80s on the Lower East Side in New York City. She was a hairdresser. She was an artist. And she was an addict. She spent 17 years as a speedball heroin junkie on the Lower East Side in wow. the 1980s. And should have died, did die. I mean, one of the things that she used to say when she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer was, you know, I've had some experience with this. <laughs> this, is a, this will be my fourth time dying. You know, she had, um, she had overdosed on, on many occasions. She had rock bottomed. Um, she, she rode life very hard and it rode her very hard. She was in prison a number of times. She was in mental hospitals a number of times. And then um, in 1998, she got clean and she was clean for 20 years. And she carried with her this extraordinary capacity to meet people as exactly who they were because of what she had been through. And because she had really literally for quite a long time been the worst person in the world, um, she never judged anybody. You know, um, I'm such a perfectionist and I'm such a goody two-shoes and I try so hard to never do anything wrong. And so when I see people behaving in a way that I would call wrong, I can be very condemning of it. And what I loved about Rhea more than anything else was that she understood that there are people trapped in their minds in ways that somebody like me could never understand. And she could be in the room with absolutely anybody who was behaving in absolutely any way. And she had tremendous boundaries. She would never let them mess with her. She was very street smart. She was very tough. But hmm. she also was the most forgiving human being I've ever met. And when I asked her one time, why are you so forgiving? I've, you have such a capacity to forgive. And she said, I've had to beg forgiveness from so many people for things that I've done. And they've given it to me that forgiveness and mercy are what I owe. And I was her best friend. I mean, we were, we were best friends for years and years and years. But I was always kind of in love with her. But I, I just kept the boundary because I was married and I didn't want to cross that boundary. And then she got sick and then it was like, there's no way I'm not letting her know what she is to me. So it was because of the diagnosis that, that you decided you had to make this a public relationship? There was no way. There was a vision I had in my head and it was the scariest thing I ever saw. It was me sitting in a hospital room holding her hand while she died and her never knowing that she was the love of my life. Mm. I couldn't do it just couldn't do it not for any vow not for not for any reason could I do it and so I just had to tell the truth and um she was in love with me too we had just been very careful with each other so we had an amazing 
Mm. Very romantic, beautiful, tiny piece of moment together, and then she died. I mean, Liz, there are probably, you know, some of the many millions of people who who read Eat, Pray, Love and who had this, they love this perfect ending, right? You know, the happily ever after ending and um, will have been, sh- you know, sh- shocked by by what happened in a way. What's your message to them? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to them because when I made this announcement, they responded with love and compassion. And I didn't get a single person say, you ruined my favorite book. Um People are human enough and wise enough to know Mm. that my life didn't end on the last page of that book. Mm. And in the same way that your life didn't end last weekend, you know, um, our lives are this moving canvas that's very chaotic and stuff happens to people. Hearts change, you know, events occur Mm. that shock us even as they're happening to us. And it never occurred to me to not be very open and honest about it. I put it right out there. I wanted to be able to walk around holding Rhea's hand without having to feel like I was doing something wrong. And mm. and I just felt like, well, I'm a known person. You're going to be seeing me with this person. Let me tell you what's going on. Here's what's going on. And And the response of the world has been completely loving um, mm. and, and very beautiful about it. But you, you knew at the same time in, in that decision that you were signing up for one, two years of the deepest pain. I, I thought mean, I love, was signing up for pain. six months at the time. It turned out to be 18. Couldn't be anywhere else but by her side. From the minute of her diagnosis, it was physically painful for me to be anywhere but in the room with her. There was nowhere else in the world I could have been. And the idea of anyone else going through that with her made me enraged. I was like... In the yeah. first the first doctor's appointments that she went to, I was I was I wasn't there, and I was so angry. I was like, "This is mm. my job. <laughs> this is my person. This is my mm. love. I need to be next to her through this." Um, and it was harrowing. It wasn't fun, you know. It wasn't. I mean, we had an amazing few months where we really got to actually have fun because we were so thrilled that we got to finally be together. But it was horrible. It was dreadful. And cancer's dreadful. When she left, do you feel that? I, I don't want to, you know, over romanticize this or anything. But did did is there a sense that she left in in a in peace, in a sort of feeling of some kind of resolution, or was it is it just <laughs> awful? And that, that these are the kind of stories that we try and oh, tell ourselves God. after to try and make life bearable. Chris, she was such a badass. You know, Rhea was such a warrior. She never did anything peacefully. (laughs) You know, I came in with all my, like, yoga ideas, and I was like, we're going to orchestrate and curate the most beautiful, peaceful death. And that is not what happened because that's not what Rhea's life was like, and it's not Mm. what her death was like. She went down swinging. I mean, I said to... um, her ex-wife, Gigi, who was in the room. I mean, the the really beautiful thing that happened at the end of her life were that the three women who took care of her while she was dying were her ex-wife, her ex-girlfriend, and me. (laughs) And um, it just shows how loved she was. You know, I mean, she was so devoutly loved by all of us. And and we just came together as her wives, really. Like, it took three of us because she was so hardcore and she was not an easy patient. And she wasn't, you know, she didn't have a Zen death. She didn't have a monk's death. She went down... I think the moment after her death, I said, she just left claw marks on whoever came to get her, you know? And it's not what I wanted, but I couldn't curate it because she had agency and, and she went down fighting. And um, shortly after she died, I, I I turned my phone over to Gigi and I said, will you tell everybody because I just want to lay here with her. And Gigi went in the other room and sent text to everyone in my list saying, you know, Ray has passed away and this is Gigi letting you know. And somebody wrote back to her, I trust she had a peaceful death. And Gigi wrote back, I trust you never met Rhea Elias. <laughs> and I laugh about it because it was her and it's what I loved about her. You know, I'm, you know, she just, my personal definition of the word Rhea is that which you cannot see coming and that which you cannot control. She was such a force of nature and she wouldn't have had it any other way, you know. Mm. Um, so it's not the death I want. It's not the death I would want you to have. It's not the death that I tried to orchestrate for her, but it's a death that was absolutely in keeping with who she was. Mm. And I kind of got to hand it to her for staying consistent to the theme for the entire life (laughs) (laughs) of going through life with her fists up and just being epic. You know, that was who she was. is, Is there anything else you'd share with people about grief? I mean, it's one of these topics that, um, 
isn't comfortably talked about that much by many people. It's mm -hmm. just it's just a hard conversation to have with anyone. And yet almost everyone goes through intense grief at some point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I had my own story. Um, eight years ago, I lost my 24-year-old daughter and, you know, had, um, yeah, the world disappeared. Mm -hmm. And um, um, I, and, and there aren't many sources. Like, people don't know how to talk to you. They don't know how to relate to you. Um, everyone is loving, but they, they don't know how to help. Do you have do you have any thoughts or wisdom to to offer on that? Having just I'm new in the this? game, um, you know, it's not over. I'm in it now. Um, I'm still in grief, you know. Um, I mm. and but I know this. This is what it's teaching me about itself, and and I'm a willing student. Um, it happens upon you. It's bigger than you. There's a humility that you have to step into where you surrender to being moved through the landscape of grief by grief itself. Mm -hmm. And it has its own time frame. It has its own itinerary with you. It has its own power over you. And it will come when it comes. And when it comes, it's a bow down. It's a carve out. And it comes when it wants to, and it carves you out. It comes in the middle of the night, comes in the middle of the day, comes in the middle of a meeting, comes in the middle of a meal. You know, it arrives. It's at this tremendously forceful arrival and it cannot be resisted without you suffering more and so the way that i'm learning how to dance with grief is that when it comes i get about 10 seconds of warning <laughs> you know like oh shit here it's coming right now and i you know the posture that you take is you hit your knees in absolute humility and you let it rock you until it's done with you mm -hmm. and it will be done with you eventually and when it's done, it will leave. But to stiffen, to resist, to fight it is to hurt yourself. And there's this tremendous sort of psychological and spiritual challenge to relax in the awesome power of it until it's gone through you. I've also found, interestingly enough, that dance and music help mm -hmm. enormously. I now have a practice where I dance every day. And I'm not a dancer. I wouldn't want you to see me do it. <laughs> <laughs> but grief is a full body experience. You know, as mm. you know, it, mm. it takes over your entire body. It's not a disease mm. of the mind. You know, it's, mm. it's something that impacts you at the physical level. And to be able to actually move your body and allow movement to kind of let that energy, it's an energy that wants to go through you. I feel like it has a tremendous relationship to love because First of all, it's the, you know, as they say, it's the price you pay for love. But secondly, in the moments in my life where I have been in love, where I've fallen in love, I have just as little power over it as I do in grief. There are mm -hmm. certain things that happen to you as a human being that you cannot control or command that will come to you at really inconvenient times and where you have to bow in the human humility to the fact that there's something running through you that's bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's I see in our very arrogant culture that what we want is to, there's even the word grief management. Hmm. How are you going to manage that? Yeah. You know, it's... Yeah, those, those words feel like they don't belong in the same proximity. No, no. you can't manage that. Yeah. Um, it doesn't want to be managed. Because you, you, on Instagram, you posted something about Rare that I thought was just unbelievably moving and eloquent and so forth. Would, would you consider even reading that? Because I just think... That sure, I don't know what it is, that, but the answer is yes. I'm, oh, people keep asking yeah, me. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. People keep asking me how I'm doing, and I'm not always sure how to answer that. It depends on the day. It depends on the minute. Right this moment, I'm okay. Yesterday, not so good. Tomorrow, we'll see. Here is what I have learned about grief, though. Grief says to me, you will never love anyone the way you loved Rhea. And I reply, I am willing for that to be true. Grief says... She's gone and she's never coming back. I reply, I am willing for that to be true. Grief says, you'll never hear that laugh again. I say, I am willing. Grief says, you will never smell her skin again. I get down on the floors on my fucking knees and through my sheets of tears, I say, I am willing. This is the job of the living, to be willing to bow down before everything that is bigger than you. And nearly everything in this world is bigger than you. I don't know where Rhea is now. It's not mine to know. I only know that I will love her forever. 
and that I am willing. Willingness is everything, yeah. you know, and, and it applies to everything. Creativity too. I'm willing to do this. I'm willing to try this. I'm willing mm-hmm. to fail. I'm willing to be unsuccessful. You know, um, are you willing to take the hits and then remain in the, in the story? Or are you going to leave the story? Mm. You know, um, I don't want to miss the story. I don't want to come all this way mm. to do this life and then decide that it's too hard and not show up for it. And mm. That's really what it's about for me. <laughs> it's an honor to be in grief. Mm. It's an honor to, to feel that much, to have loved that much. And, and it's what's owed has a lot of anger in it too, which I find interesting. You know, yeah. February and March, I was just, I was like sick with rage. And, and I had this thought for a while that I was frustrated because I felt like this is interfering with my grief. And then I realized, oh no, this is my grief. <laughs> yeah. My grief is manifesting itself as ferocious, blind rage right now. Well, if you, if you believe that these, these, you know, these external things are coming to you and you don't control them, then yes, it's like the universe, how, how dare you? How you know, this is, you. how dare you take down this person in the way that you did? Mm-hmm. You know, that is, that is disgusting. That is deeply, profoundly unfair. And part of you, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but part of you, at least part, for me, part of the, um, the salve has to be to say that there just has to be random evil out there. Your worldview has to include the possibility for random evil. Like if this was someone's intention, mm-hmm. that that seems too much, mm-hmm. you know. For me, that was that was the distancing mechanism to say, for all the wonder and enchantment in the world, there is random evil, and and you better know it. And that's a bow down. That's a bow down. You know, that's humility, and it is true, and you don't get to know why. You get to know why. You're not yeah. allowed to. That those answers aren't for you, and they've never been for anyone. For all of time, nobody gets to nobody gets to see into that, and that again is part of that warehouse of mystery that I'm growing more and more comfortable with. Like you don't, you know, I you don't get to see why this why this goes this way. It just does. <laughs> it just yeah, does. Yeah. It just is. It just did. You do, know? do you believe in um, in an afterlife? Do you believe that this is just a temporary separation? I believe in an I believe in an always life. <laughs> I don't know how, if I can explain that, but but you know, Ray is very present within me. Um, you know, she, she, she's braided into me. You know, I'm very comfortable saying, if nothing else, her afterlife is living within me, changing mm. me, walking through the world with me, and making me different. We can have that, you know. Um, but I don't pretend to know much mm. more than that. I wouldn't. I, I, I think it's insulting to people to file it under mystery. I mean, anyone who's, <laughs> anyone who's been through grief can understand why there is a belief in the afterlife. Sure. Like it's, 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 um, you can certainly think of it as humans desperately wanting to believe in that as a way of dulling the pain. Um, but, but I think what you just said is, is another, I would say, more profound response. I mean, certainly for me, what made the difference after a year of exhausted gray and agony on this was just a, it's a very intentional decision to carry zoe forward you know mm. to to hold her alive to be inspired by her to be excited by her you know mm. and to imagine her her sparkle and her generosity and so forth in everything and to and and many other people felt the same and i think you can make a case that 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 is our task when someone who we love goes is to carry them forward um, they, they, of course, they will live on. You know, everything. We're all connected everything to each lives other. On. Everything lives on. Like the, everything has consequence, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. and it's and so if you that there is a way, I think, to to sort of celebrate that and to be and to sort of own that and just take the view. I will be inspired every day by this person, even though I can't actually hug them. But you see the world through a Zoe filter. Yeah. You know, I see the world through a ray of filter, and I don't want to not see the world through a ray of filter. It's a better world seen through a ray of filter. So how, how do you think of your own future now, Liz? Like, do you see days of joy and delight and, and hope ahead? Or are you now signed up as, uh, as another of the world's great, great cynics about, about life, if you like, that it's, it, it's all 
dust to dust, ashes to ashes. There's, there's nothing there. It is dust to dust, ashes to ashes. And it's amazing. You know, um, <laughs> so I don't see any reason to know that it's dust to dust, ashes to ashes, and not also think that it's extraordinary. You know, it's incredible that we get to do this. It's incredible that we get to come here and experience consciousness, and we still don't even know what the hell that is. We don't. And we, we don't. We're no closer to knowing it than we ever were. And we don't know why we have these extraordinary sensitivities and why we want to make art and why we want to make love and why we want to make war. We don't know why we're so different from every other thing that has ever lived on this planet, but we are. And it's, it's a burden and it's a privilege. And I don't think optimism is changed by tragedy. I'm tremendously excited about my life. Um, mm -hmm. I'm thrilled about it. And, and I will also say this, you know, and I want to say this very honestly because I want to dare people when they go through their own grief to think broadly, as broadly as they possibly can, as bravely and as radically as they possibly can about what their futures look like. Because the truest and broadest reality is that there is a life that I could only have with Rhea and that life is gone. But there is also a life that I can only have without her and that life is just beginning. And the fact that I was so devoted to her was such an incredible experience to have of love. But with her gone, to be very honest, there are things I could do that I couldn't have done before. And people feel guilty about saying that because they feel like it's disloyal or that it's criminal to say that, that this person wanted to live and wanted to do these things, you know. But, but what I'm exploring now is okay, these are the new terms. The person I loved more than anyone in the entire world, the one person in the world I always said I cannot live without is gone. So what does that leave me in terms of what I now get to be? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now I'm a person and there's no one in the world I can't live without. That's very freeing. Um, where can I go? What can I explore? What worlds can I move in now? What freedom can that bring me? And how can I do that without sacrificing one bit of the love and devotion and passion that I had with this one completely irreplaceable human being? So I got to have that. I didn't want it to end the way it ended, but it wasn't up to me. It ended the way it ended, but now I get to have whatever's coming. And it is ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And it is amazing, and I wouldn't miss it for the world. Liz Gilbert, to, to hear those words from someone um, who's been through what you've been through, I mean, that's one of the most powerful and inspiring things I, I think I've, I can remember. So I, I, I don't know what to say. I, thank you so much for coming, spending this time, <laughs> opening your heart, and, and sharing with us just, just so much wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I love talking to you. This week's show was produced by Sharon Mashihi. Our associate producer is Kim Nederfein Peterser. Special thanks to Helen Walters. Our show is mixed by David Herman, and our theme music is by Alison Leighton Brown. In our next episode, I talk with David Deutsch, a physicist and personal hero of mine. We talk mostly about knowledge and why he believes its power is unlimited and what that idea might mean for our collective future. The only thing that can prevent, let's say, a spaceship from Earth reaching something 100 light years away is the question whether we want to do this. We may decide not to, in which case we won't do it. But the issue of whether a spaceship can get there is a matter of what we decide to do. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening, or find some other way of sharing with anyone you know who is curious. Thank you for listening. <laughs>